Greetings, everyone! It is I, Tantus Narabatrick, your Lord and Emperor, here at the Dracovan Empire, and welcome! For those of you joining me live on Twitch, hi again. For those of you joining me on YouTube side, well, you're in for a treat today. We're diving back into the world of Starfinder! As of the streaming and recording of this video, Second Edition Starfinder has been announced, but before it comes out, which is honestly in a few years, let's go over more species you can play in Starfinder, because honestly, this is one of the big things you can do. Whereas Pathfinder focused a lot more on different classes, and then you had a limited selections of ancestries, species, races that you could kind of play as, in comparison, still a good number of them, Starfinder expands it more with having a selection of classes, not as massive, but a lot more species you can play. And we've touched on a small percentage of them today. And honestly, when I was deciding how many to talk about today, it was a small percentage. And I'm going to see how I'm feeling around letter F before we hit up letter G. Because <laughs> I'm going alphabetically. We went through the base uh, core species and the returning ones from Pathfinder that were specifically mentioned uh, and kind of separated out. And then we went from A and B last time. So if you missed that video, go back and watch it. It's good. It, it introduces you into a lot of these. And we're going to do something similar today. We're going to dive in. We're going to learn more about them. Hopefully you might be want to play some of these very interesting and unique ones. And I did, unlike last time, manage to find an image for all of these. So, hey, that's very really awesome. But we should kind of dive into it and get started because we got a guide to talk about. Anyway, uh, that's a good one. Is that better? That one better? We'll do that one then for now. We'll see if that uh, fits it. And, and let's get started, though, because we do have the Cephalum here. Um, so, yes, the Cephalum. Uh, so, originally, kind of, their hint about them existing happens right after the gap. There was uh, some details of a species that swam in methane with a very plant-like physiology and kept living symbiotes and built homes out of the bodies of their dead and communicated through bioluminescence. They assumed to be somebody's insanity until they showed up in Absalom Station. And so they are a species you can play. Uh, strength and Wisdom bonuses con is a penalty. They glow. They've got bioluminescent abilities, cold resistance, dark vision. Uh, not, uh, they're kind of plant-like. They've got these symbiotes, which you basically um, choose one of the symbiotes and it gives you a bonus. And uh, they're going to get depths. And they're kind of plant-like. So, um... Kind of, on the outside, its body is very, not very unusual. Kind of cylindrical, thick muscular, head decorated with fan-like frills, uh, two flexible uh, tentacles, um, a kind of foot which ends in uh, 6 to 12 kind of tentacle-like toes. Um, I believe that is the symbiote for this one, yes. That, that is coming out. Uh, and a lab bioluminescent patterns on each individual. Basically, at age five, they can kind of mask, by then they've masked the light they can give off into these patterns, which is then their language, Lumos, the native language that they communicate with. Um, they kind of look like squids, but they internally are very much more like plants. And their tentacles are actually cl closer to vines. Um, their brain and vital organs take uh, long, fibrous uh, stems that run through the length of their bodies. Uh, they are uh, monocuous. Uh, each individual has both male and female structures. Um, anyone can fertilize any others. Um, traditionally, they've done this in the methate of their current of their home. Um, but, you know, as long as they've had recorded history, uh, they are more like, you know, they use the methane to reproduce a lot of times. So there's that random chance of plants, but there are romantic tales of those that, you know, fertilize each other in defiance of random chance. So they have their own romance stories, which is completely interest for a plant-like creature that would honestly reproduce very randomly, normally. Um, they mature around 12 and lived about their 80s. 
Um, they metabolize energy through their skin. Uh, because they live in methane, they can't photosynthesize, and they deal with pressure a lot. And it's also a cold planet where they come from. Um, so yeah, and they can deal with some background radiation. So the world, so the big thing is they have the symbiotes, which are called uh, Kriegkeeks, um, uh for the uh, Cephalum. God, I'm going to butcher some of these names, how they really should be pronounced, but I'm just a guessing. Um, uh, so the thing is, the Kirikik aren't native to where they come from, uh, from Luminar. Um, which is a gas giant orbiting a red dwarf in near space. Their quest to figure out where these Kirikik, these things that are basically a symbiote with them, came from, has been a real reason why they went to the stars. And, you know, a Kirikik is traditionally two to three length in diameter. Uh, they have physical variations. Some have air bladders, heat sensitive eyes, prehensile tentacles. So that is a prehensile tentacle there. Um, they technically live for very a few centuries. They reproduce very rank, uh, rarely and are passed down through uh, Salafum families. Um, traditionally, they do symbiote on the upper body. Um, and a older Salafum of great age or social status could be bonded with more than one uh, Kirikik. Um... The symbiote's hard shell protecting their head, foot, tentacled arm. Um, and they produce bioelectric pulses that kind of communicate in a code very similar to Lumos. Um, even by cellophumes, their uh, cellophumes, the language of these symbiotes isn't really understood. They kind of do. Uh, we know that they know that they experience pleasure and play, pain. Um, they have preferences and desires, but they don't really have a cultural, and they are just content to cooperate with the cellophones, um, as long as they're treated well. Um, it is very rare for a Kirikik to refuse a bond with a host, uh, but it can happen. Um, and t good, you know, cellophones consider it good to care for these. Uh, it's a positive sign of health, and basically kind of personal hygiene almost, to take good health of your symbiote. Uh, so, in the Luminar system, there really isn't any other intelligent life. Um, it's a very rocky, maybe cold planet. It's a system that doesn't have a lot there. Um, there could have been mining that happened before the gap. Um, unknown. Uh, Luminar itself has three layers. Um, the outer layer is kind of the sky... It's a region of glowing hot hydrogen and helium glass with some trace uh, helium gas and some trace elements. The middle layer is dominated by the methane in a liquid state because of the pressure where the uh, cellophones have evolved, and the core is kind of more of a frozen ball of methane. Uh, methane. So they do have a rich and complex uh, society. Um, their pre-gap knowledge is filled with reference to the pre-industrial history they have. Um, they have references to their... Of course, again, other societies have references before the gap. It's sort of the gap is just the missing knowledge for like a hundred years. So they have information on their pre-industrial history. Um, basically, they honored an ancestors and traditions. Um, they Before the gap, they prize curiosity, visual arts, physical aptitude, repertoire etiquette. Uh, poet athletes, warrior artists were a big thing in their lifestyles and stuff. They don't really have a lot of mineral resources, um, so things passed down through generations are very important. Um, they hadn't used money when they arrived at Absalom, though the idea existed as a concept to them. So they didn't, they, it's not like they didn't understand money, it's like, you know... Yes, they're plants that don't use it. I'm assuming they use, like, the natural methane energy and stuff around them and stuff like that. It's sort of like there are plants that technically don't really need sunlight the same way, or, like, some plant-like creatures. They may be closer to something more akin to, like, a, a fungus, or somewhere in between a plant and a fungus or something like that, you know? 
Um, yeah, so uh, chemosynthesis is probably how they more uh, do things. Anyway, um, so again, they had in their society complex web of patronage, political alliances, and family ties that kind of swing, uh, shared material. But again, they were smart enough to understand this concept of money as something that was theoretical, but they really just never needed to implement it. So encountering money wasn't completely alien to them. They were like, oh, that's very interesting. Um, during the gap, they changed from industrial to space travel. But that's the thing is, it happened during the gap. Um, the first starships were made of the same construction material as their architecture. Um, and that is, of course, their corpses of their dead and stuff like that. They, they made their buildings out of their own dead. I mean, it's a main material you have when you have little things. But in order to go to space, they had to kind of magically petrify and preserve these corpses. Um, they're still made in this manner of a Celephoom's spaceship. Um... But technical advantages that they found from other species have brought back. Um, and uh, the idea of traveling far, though, without the ancestors unsettles a lot of Celephooms. So, I mean, that's why they still do it, too. So it's like, okay, we've encountered spaceships can be built out of these other things. But, you know, when we pass away, our bodies are used to build the things around us. We're used to having honestly the corpses of our fellows around us at all times because once they're dead it's like a tree it's a building material kind of weird but makes sense in a kind of plant way um so they don't have sound producing organs they have language lumos based on biolim in essence it's a visual language uh dependent on light and visibility um they can see out into darkness because they live in methane seas, so they have a kind of a dark vision anyway, and can notice each other at a distance. They kind of have learned common, uh, but it's very slow. Um, they basically... Lumos was the more understood language, and they could basically learn it. Um, and effectively there have been things developed that allow them to translate their bioluminescence into language and stuff like that because they don't have a sound producing organ <laughs> yeah so they're one of the more interesting species that we have a lot of information on um as provided so far by paizo so it's fun to talk about them Let's move on, though, because there are more that we can talk about. And another one that we do have a good amount of information on is this one here, which is a very funny and interesting rage, is the contemplative. Uh, and yes, they are a immense brain with a tiny forearmed uh, body kind of dangling below it. That really is what they are. Oh, and the um, our good friends there, the Selfum, uh can actually swim and walk on land. So they have a, I forgot to mention, they have a, a very slow land speed and a swim speed, because they swim in methane um so they have a very big bonus to intelligence and some charisma and penalties to strength and con and you know yes that is a contemplative um <laughs> um the, for basically millennia they basically tried to unravel the esoteric circuits from the safety of their isolated homes on Akaton one of the planets in the Galarian star system and since drift travel they've begun to wander the galaxy. They oftentimes serve as doctors, scientists, investigators, mystical consultants, supernatural warriors. Um, they don't really act alone very often. Um, even when there's loners of them, they refer to we and not I, because they do have a collective mindset um, that they kind of connect with each other. Um, so yes. They psychically levitate themselves. They fly supernaturally. But they do have a land speed of five. Uh, their limbs are practical, almost vestigial. Um, they can manipulate tools like one-handed weapons uh, without difficulty. They can't really use two-handed weapons and um, without using psychic powers or technical telekinetic powers. So they have really trouble with that. 
Um, they have a blind sense and a dark vision, and limited telepathy. Um, they are monstrous humanoids. It, it, they, they are a thing. So basically, now the thing is here, you wouldn't think that, but that is 100 pounds. That thing is 100 pounds, and 70 pounds of it is brain. <laughs> Uh, the rest of them have a spindly humanoid body that stings from their neck as, like, a kind of ligaments, neuropathways, blood vessels. Basically, they have enough of a body to support a giant brain, but they're basically a giant brain. Uh, yeah. They don't really have legs, it's all just limbs. They, they could sort of comp uh, hold their weight for a few seconds, but they're not really good at it. They use their psychic abilities to hold themselves up. But they do walk in air, um, you know, kind of an ancestral memory. So as they're floating along, they'll move their legs as they're walking. Um, <laughs> it's kind of interesting, too, definitely. Uh, their upper limbs, they do have upper and lower limbs. The upper ones are a lot more hand-like and stuff. Um, but, uh, as you can see, they do have two other limbs, which are basically sense organisms, which are, uh, smell and touch. Um, these limbs could have probably been a lot more, but again, with their psychic abilities having developed, they've also honestly kind of lost a lot of their abilities, so... They have, like, a sense, uh, uh, these two limbs that are sense and touch here also on their bodies. Um, for the, for, uh, for two of their arms. So they have two legs, two hands, and then two sense limbs for their six limbs that they have. Uh, they do have eyes, which protect a short distance from the bottom of their brains. Um, um, their brains are supernaturally sophisticated. They do have an insane brain-to-body ratio, honestly. Um, you know. <laughs> uh, it, it, they, they basically have to master their personal telekinesis, because if not, they can't move themselves, basically. Um, when they are truly unconscious, though, they're they're at low risk of suffocation or organ damage to basically being unable to support the mass compressed on delicate innards and restrict them. Uh, so true sleep is a rare enjoyment uh, using specialized hammocks or fluid baths, basically, to uh, support their body. Because if not, they could crush their own body if they actually truly sleep. Um, so, you know, that's why that's probably like, oh, we get a special hammock or, you know, a fluid bath that I can actually take a real nap in. Um, and instead they rest by logging, kind of like aquatic mammals do. Um, basically allowing their brain to sleep while they maintain buoyancy and some awareness. Uh, so they did evolve in Akaton, um, over countless generations, the fourth planet from the sun. Um, there are ruins from ancient eras on them, uh, very scoured by the elements and stuff like that. They, they rely less on physiological changes and more on habitat manipulation. With sediments burrowing into mountains, deeping deep underground with telepathic excavations. Um, yeah. There is two major sites, the Ashtok Crater and Halls of Reason in the, major, in the modern era. Um, the Ashtok Crater is nearly uninhabited uh, as it functions as a psychic amplifier. And these are kind of like old places. So they've spread throughout the galaxy at this point in time. Small tight-knit communities and existing celebrants, laboratories, universals, hospitals, research stations. Basically any place that they can think about. Um, even though outside the packed worlds, they're a small part of them because they reproduce very slowly. Um, yeah. Which, I'm going to say here, I don't really talk about that in the, this here, and I'm... Honestly... I'm not gonna ask. <laughs> how, how they get together? May, they do, apparently. Um, giant brains. Anyway, um... 
so even though they are very community driven in a way their existence often does revolve around isolation because it's the idea of deep thought um you know and contemplative contemplative as their name is thought um so a lot of times in solitude they achieve great things that are objectively their own triumphs validating the existence of the cosmos but they kind of need this community too um because it provides strength and and, and and security a lot of times so you know a lot of times their community ends up being with other species because then they can kind of be deep within their own thoughts and while that's something they all kind of want to do being around other species means that they can have that, you know, strength security that they need. Granted, peers offer engagement, intellectually challenged theories, build upon discovery, encourage them. Um, so they would establish tight knit uh, telepathic neighborhoods uh, with that, if you get into it, uh, telekinetic field that protects them you know they sense anything that would affect their brain we don't ask their biologically ability is just a little bit weird um to say the least but basically they had these communities that would basically mentally chatter with themselves con uh, constantly um even so, like, that's one of those things is, yes, they are in deep thought a lot. They still crave the feelings of others in thought, you know, because they're in these smaller groups that are basically think tanks that exist. Um, so it's like, e even, you, you still want to have a little thoughts of your own, but you also want to be able to, like, discuss these thoughts. Like, I've been thinking about this meaning of this part of the universe, you know, like, I was contemplating it late last night, and let's discuss it all together and something like that. Um... So it's this kind of extremes of wanting to be separate to be able to contemplate things, but the unity of basically being able to then share those thoughts with others and discuss them and stuff like that. It's a juxtaposition in their culture. Um, so balance of this, a lot of enclaves apart from other species, small communities manifesting group consciousness, and they're kind of never quite true hive minds, but they're... Um, but again, this lack of isolationism means that they oftentimes, as I said, use we instead of I. Um, anyway. Um, we can kind of dive a little bit more into Ashok, their psychic uh, traits, newer divisions and stuff. But that's kind of the basics of them. I think that's a good enough to dive into. There is a little bit more information here uh, to go on about. So certainly... Um, there is more examples. But it would be up to folks if you want to dive a little bit more into them. But that is a basic idea of the contemplative. Our really interesting psychic brain people. Uh, which I can't see their eyes on that one there. Uh, that was a little better for that. I'll put it over top of it. We'll switch it off. I'll switch between them as we need for these things. There are plenty of questions about them that I have that I don't think I can ask. So, this is the Copaxi. Now, what is a Copaxi? It's a colony of coral-like polyps that have developed an anthropomorphic form. They're kind of like a swarm. Bonus to con, charisma penalties to wisdom. They have blind sense. Um, they have some gravity adjustment abilities. Um to say the least. They're natural communicators. Um, and they have regenerative evolution as abilities. So, yes. They develop, they have exo, semi, segmented exoskeletons of rich, uh, calcium-rich shells that cover most of their bodies. Their heads develop a lever, crests and horns to identify the individual. Each polyp includes a set of five feeding tentacles about two inches long, suitable for filter feeding or catching extremely small play, and pose little threat to the larger targets beyond painful scratches. The polyps' bodies extend beneath the exoskeleton, intertwining uh, with additional polyps to create sheets of fiber muscles and even transform into specialized tissues for processing information, including sensing surrounded, storing mutants, eliminating toxics, or reproducing. 
Uh, over their 40-year lifespan, individual polyps die and are replaced by new individuals in which they can then grow to address the needs. Yes. They're indigenous to Tabard Minor, an industrialized, a heavily industrialized world in near space, as gravity fluctuations associated with the uh, Kopi, an unintelligent coral-like organism related to the Kopiaks. Kind of like cells over their, like, Think about, like, they're, like, what if barnacles were a hive mind? There you go. Um, so, they've, their society values respect for leadership and technological innovation and preserving individual expression. Uh, each city is comprised of many individuals all working to a common goal, behaving like a giant copex. Um... Legends of depraved spellcasters inspire many superstitions intended to protect against witchcraft, even though magic use is quite rare. They're avid explorers uh, and quickly absorb other language and cultures. They are very new to interstellar travel, um, uh, but they do promote the traveling to pack worlds and hoping to procreate there. Um, They're kind of a little bit more cautious, though, so, like, they want to spread, but they're kind of, like, slow to spread, so more aggressive people that spread about are kind of, like, a little cautious about that. So they mature at five and then live, like, to 40 to 50 years, uh, technically. Um, so the thing is, they have two names, a shell name and a flesh name, and that's kind of, like... Um, a community grants a flesh name to a group a younger cluster of polyps that have uh, have unified uh, to begin forming an adult uh, copsy. And once the exoskeleton is complete, uh, a nascent crest has started to form. Uh, the new adults select a shell name to combine with their flesh name. So basically, like, yes, you'll replace polyps in your body that they die and reproduce, but you also, like, will try to create you know, smaller polyps, which will then kind of merge together into new ones. They're sentient coral. You know, it's an interesting one. And I would like more information about these. They're only in the Alien Archive 4. So this is one of those ones that it would be like, it would be really cool to know more about. Uh, which, unfortunately, we just... We currently don't have. It would be nice. Um, but... We can move on, though, to some more interesting species. Uh, the Demai. So, they're known throughout the galaxy as... Uh, the people known throughout the galaxy as Demais are survivors of a shattered planet. Um, it's ancient, even on the scale of the universe. Um, modern history is merely about 200-year-old for the Demai. Um... Demico, a dry, rocky planet near space, uh, basically transformed when an event called the Awakening racked the land with uh, uh, earthquakes, evaporated their oceans, withered the greenery, um, and uh, awakened a terrible colossi at the heart of their legends, known as uh, Kilkors. Um, which, I can just look into the Kilkors for a second. Uh, they don't give a lot of Thank you for not giving me information on it, though you mentioned it. Oh, there it is. Uh, yeah. Giant magical colossi. Um, a living po po apocalypse, basically. Uh, CR 20. Man, no. Uh, anyway. They lure us in their somber beneath the seabeds to destroy the inhabitants in short order. There was two societies prior to this on Dominico. Uh, there were advanced warring societies. The Holy Kingdom of Yarath which had a divine mandate uh, of one of the eph ephemeral lords and the psychic confederation of Vulcarium. They were driven underground, regardless of allegiance, because of the dis great destruction, huddled in caverns that became known as the ref Refuge. 150 years passed, and they basically dealt with the cultural trauma of the Awakening. Um... They were, they were a fragile people, uh, threaded with natural rhythms of psychic energy, empathic magic, uh, braids of uh, both 
they basically adapted to the hardy, resourceful people they are today. But 50 years ago, uh, one of the wise leaders from their deepest pockets of the refuge basically wanted to reunite their people for good. Um, he sought to build, build the solidarity among the refugees despite the fact that the class ice were rampant on the surface. He ba at Great Lisk, she tra traversed the lightless cabins to make contact with other refugee settlements, inviting their leaders to travel to the lake, contact the surviving ones, and forming a man to basically connect together um, even fully spiritually. Um, kind of human-like. I, I, I have a, a little bit of a physical uh, description here. But they are very, basically a very human-like uh, being. Um, uh, so, uh, ba basically they are just humanoids. So, um, so again... They managed to come across a uh, cache of rune-scribed orbs. Most of them thought baubles. Uh, Use elements of power must lost civilization. Um, but they were kind of magical items. Um, gave them strength and stuff too. They bonded. Uh, the Koloku found the orbs. The person that was in charge of them bonded the user. Suddenly confronted information on the marauding Kalkzai. Basically, these orbs were able to influence the beast's behavior. Stress to the user, though. Um, they became guardians. They returned to their settlements. Um, some died along the way, but basically, guardians. They used the orbs to fortify their settlements. Um... Because it was powerful to, that connected artifacts that connected to the Colossi, which destroyed their world. Um, basically, some were able to bond with the Colossi to use them to protect themselves above ground. Um, others just strengthened their underground there. The Guardians commanded great power, um, and basically, you know. They were still mortal, you know, the, the, the thing about it, too. So the Guardian had to find, train their successor over dozens of years in order to keep it going and stuff like that, too. Um, yeah, so basically reached the point in time for their society where they're emerging from their slumber beneath the ground and... Finding these artifacts that basically connect with the horrible slaven colossi which ravaged their uh, planet uh, to basically keep one as a guardian or control it or use some of its power kind of has advanced them in certain ways. Uh, they get bonus to charisma, dex, penalty to wisdom, they have low light vision, they're scrappy survivors. Mature at 14, um, live about 100 years. Um, so. Yup. There are some uh, demise that were not on the planet. Um, basically, um, they're just slight differences. Um, but again, there are some alternate racial traits, alternate ability adjustments because of that. And just to think of, you know, it's, you know, some managed to leave the cataclysm which destroyed their home planet and drove most of them below ground. And some of them are now just trying to merge back into space and stuff at this point in time. Let's keep going. We have plenty more to talk about. And uh, these cool uh, moth-like people. Which are the Disarmar Imago. They're natives of uh, Kishoria, uh, a world that's bathed in violet magical auras uh, in Aslanti space. Their adults resemble bipedal butterflies. Uh, they hatch from eggs as tiny larvae that grow as mature. Uh, the larvae are referred to by Aslanti as instars. Um, basically an error in first contact reporting. The instars eat magical plants. Uh, their flesh is coated with a hallucinogenic powder, mulling the senses of predators uh, with gut-tinging vengeance. The instars are sapient. Uh, and older larvae are encouraged to explore the world on their own so they can discover their life path before metamorphosizing into an adult. So, yes, they are kind of like a, a caterpillar larva. They're still sentient in that form, 
Uh, and, you know, you're encouraged as your, like, larval form to, you know, kind of figure out what you want to do. Once they're ready, uh, they feast enough to double in size before spinning magical cocoons. Two weeks later, an adult uh, Desimar, uh, called an Imago, emerges. Uh, there are those instars instar that refuse to transform. Um... Uh, there are most uh, Demostars, except older Instars, the adult Imago will often encourage Larva to seek physical maturity. Their society is based upon magic, uh, studying the Koshanian auras, they worship Desna, uh, there tend to be good nature, whimsical, like, ex expressions, uh, self-expression self exploration. They technically have a lot of technology that's bioengineered, hybrid of both. Um, they have a clannish high, uh, society hierarchy based on that's merit based. The wisest one guiding the rest. Um, Instars mostly pursue their passions, while Imigos seek wisdom and mastery of life path. Um, they can be peaceful to a, a fault, though, which kind of makes them aloof and detached sometimes. So the Aslanti Star Empire claims their planet. They tend to just ignore the Aslanti. Um, so the these uh, the Desmar are kind of just curiosities to the Aslanti too. Um, so they don't have competing interests at all. Um, the Desmar texts kind of quaint. There's no clashes, little cultural contact between the two societies. Um, Desmar, aside from some curious instars, avoid the Aslanti enclaves. Um, and the Aslanti don't have a use for them. Um, basically, as the Aslanti alien relationship in their empire, this is the most harmonious that exists. Um, the Desmar do have a secret, though. Uh, the auras of Kashtar have a varying, uh, mostly an ostrich effect, uh, such as giving off dim light or causing mild euphoria. Um, some of these eldritch energies have connections to the dark tapestry. Yeah, mm-hmm. Uh, those that study these auras uh, ensure the connections never bring about unwanted attentions from aberrations or other dark among the stars to the planet, though. Um, as the Anthe in their ignorant state uh, were to hinder efforts to monitor these auras, the results could be disastrous. The dark tapestry is where, like, Cthulhu horrors come from. Yes. Uh, they're typically around 5 feet tall, weigh about 60 pounds. Um, the instar is about 3 feet tall, weigh 40 pounds. Uh, females are often larger and stronger than males. Uh, they get bonuses to strength, wisdom, penalties uh, to... Uh, bonuses to wisdom, strength, and charisma, penalty, strength. They have some uh, spell-like abilities, uh, blind sense to arrange, and low-light vision. Um, Fragile limbs, and uh, the Imago have a movement that they have a land speed and a fly speed. And they can twinkle, um, which is basically a teleportation ability. Um, once per day. But also, we can show off, of course, which a lot of this I've already talked about. Hey, there's, a, there's one of those uh, instars which decided not to change. So, most of everything I've talked about is, of course, the same. Honestly, you could play an Instar, too. Uh, you know, the Instar is about 3 feet long, 40 pounds, 5 foot tall, uh, 60 pounds for the adult. The main difference here is their movement, and they have kind of poor vision. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, that's the thing is they have a land speed and a climb speed. Uh, otherwise, uh, they have, uh, similarly, uh, dust around them. Oh, actually, let me check with the other one. Uh, just to compare the racial abilities and stuff here. Uh, they both have the same amount of magic, uh, both same, uh, senses. The one has a dream skill, this one has a dream dust. Uh, the Mago has, uh, fragile limbs and has some penalties from that with their movement and their twinkle. This one also has a twinkle, but has poor vision instead of limbs. Yes, they are adorable little, uh, larval that, you know, again, sometimes they decide they don't want to metamorphosize into an adult. 
and it's their choice because it's a kind of magical process almost in a way they're magic moth people and some of them remain as caterpillars and they get a climb speed instead of a fly speed uh you know it, it's an interesting part of society i assume you know you have to be an adult before you'd have kind of kids and sometimes you know you maybe don't want to have kids you know you don't want to you don't want to reproduce and maybe you just want to go on adventures your entire life and you don't really want to settle down with the things you know um so you know you, some, some are like that. They just don't choose not to transform. So you have a choice of being a, a Mago, or a little bit rarer, but around an Instar, you could be one. And they're kind of adorable. I, I will agree. Uh, the, uh, the Caterpillar people. The uh, Deeringdi. Um, so from the Cosmopolitan Arakanon, which is uh, the prominent amongst uh, Leovaran's many moons, is prominent home to one of the most learned urban populations in the Pact Worlds. There are two sapient species uh, with an intertwined history, and I will talk about the other one in the future, uh, Sarazans, but today we're going to talk about the Drindis. So the two species co-govern their world and work uh, at most enterprises collect collectively. Uh, Drindis provide creativity, optimism, and ideas, while the scholarly Skarzans uh, make sure projects stay on schedule and on budget. They get along, complement each other's strength, and respect each other's differences. So that's, this is two sapient species that grew up together and found commonality. Um, so uh, Drindis are stout humanoids with three eyes and an affinity for humor and electricity. They greet each other with zaps of electricity and outrageous retelling of recent adventures. And visitors to Arakan are unlikely to avoid some enthusiastic zapping from the locals. They basically can taser each other. Uh, their family units are large and complex, uh, with extensive networks of siblings and cousins. They often adopt friends of other, of other species into the chaos, uh, specifically Sarzans, gnomes, and other humans. They're born, born to two biological parents, uh, but most are polyamorous, uh, committing to multiple partners uh, for long-term caring relationships and sharing, raising, and education of the young. Uh, they can be found in any very profession, but they're drawn to social professions and are often bureaucrats, educators, merchants, and politicians. They love to laugh and believe in no tale cannot be better made with embellishment. They are prone to exaggeration and hyperbole, use allegories and jokes uh, to kind of approach deeper truths. Uh, they're not really out to deceive, but they will kind of like, you know, um, you know, because again, it's the joke's not funny unless everybody's in on it. You know, so they don't want to not trick you. Uh, so con artists and social predator predators are outcasts, and uh, those kind of offenses are punished harshly according to their law. They do support honesty and disclosure, but they can be lazy with the details. And, you know, um, they can have conjecture that they have, if they have gaps in knowledge, that they don't mind filling gaps with. So if they, if they don't know something, they'll just fill it with conjecture. And there's a phrase in the pack worlds, as accurate as a Drindy fact checker. Um, yeah, so. They have lax research and unreliable newscasts. Uh, but because of this, their newscasts are some of the more popular in the uh, packed worlds. So what they lack in accuracy, raw enthusiasm. They are a big, uh, good linguist. And uh, they broadcast in virtual every known language in the packed worlds. Um, there's another population on the moon of Oriso, uh, whose population is from before the gap. Or so, or so another moon has large predators and toxic gas seas, uh, but hardly charge ac atmosphere and frequent lightning storms, uh, which was irresistible to Drindy who settled there. They're proud of the pioneer heritage, and um, they look at their Arakan brethren as soft urbanites. Uh, there are very few Sarazons travel to uh, Orso, um, and the Drindys on the moon have become more serious, self-reliance, and survival-oriented. They still tell wildly exaggerated tales of uh, hunts for the creatures of the planet and adventures to celebrate the same holy days as their counterparts at Arakan, 
but the seas themselves as independent. So you could come from either colony originally. They get bonuses to Dex and Charisma, penalty to Wisdom. Uh, they're convenial, which means they're good at languages. They've got uh, a blind sense with electric. And uh, bonuses to Perception and low light vision. They resist electricity and they have a energy ray electric only that they can use at will and jolting surge. And since they're resistant to electricity, I mean, that makes sense. All right, let's keep going because we have a bunch of these. Uh, I'll see again how long this takes. I might call it uh, a lot earlier than I thought I was, honestly. We might end at F or E, depending on how long this all takes. Because uh, I want to give all the, honestly, species their own right and kind of talk about them. The Drillic. Um, So, the Shadarai Confederacy lies cloaked deep in an area known as the Korzak Nebula. Uh, it's ionized gas, uh, various colors and such. Uh, the area there houses many fugitives, insurgents, or scoundrels, uh, and is led by the inhabitants of the Great Shadar, a waterless planet orbiting the system's dim star. Inhabitants of that are the Drelix, which unite the uh, Confederacy lawless ideas. They support that. To outsiders, there seem more to behold it to grotesque uh, Scandinars. Extraplanar creatures from the negative energy plane and uh, the main prejudice of their faith. They are gaunt humanoids seven feet in height. They have vestigial gills on their necks, slightly webbed hands that hint that they may have been once an aquatic race. But, but that since their planet currently has no oceans or lakes, it more likely, if they were once aquatic, they adapted long from it. And instead of hairs, they have short bristles on their heads. Uh, their skin, skin color varies from shades of yellow, mustard, saffron... They have three fingers and a thumb on each hand, and their limbs are slightly longer than that of humans. Um, the majority have a mystical markings resembling a third R that appears on their forehead. It's known as the Eye of Enlightenment. And it adheres to the philosophy of Al Altriax. Um, again, it marks with their belief in the negative energy preachers. Kind of cony, but with a third eye. Members of the faith don't secretly, uh, uh, actively seek out to destroy because they believe in kind of infantry. They just basically little do to prevent or uh, reverse natural deterioration. Basically, they have a belief from of entropy almost. Uh, they only build items that speed up this decay, mostly using negative energy. It's a pseudo religion that's throughout the Confederacy, basically which they control over. And uh, many races native to the nebula count themselves as followers, basically being the eye of uh, enlightenment in a ritualistic process. Or at least very tattoos similar to that. Uh, you know, a lot of outsiders conflate this nihilistic philosophy of Atraxia to the cult of the devourer. Uh, the Drelic find this comparison deeply offensive. Um... See, they basically believe that this the path is a stately and dignified march to the inevitable end of all things. You know, rather than bringing it about. The ordained end of all things. And that the followers, um, the devourers' followers, cheapen the experience and ruin generations uh, by thrashing about in childlike tantrums. There are few relics that don't follow the entropic beliefs, generally, and they uh, leave the Kerchak Nebula to find fortune in the wider galaxy. Uh, they basically reject their home's nihilism. They are still drawn to careers that emphasize uh, deep ingrained talents of their people, uh, hiring themselves as assassins, thieves, uh, mystics of dubious morality. Um, those that encase themselves in shining armor and fight for every race and creed are very rare. Not that you couldn't find them. Um, but there are those that seek to uh, shatter the mold and contend with their own inner demons. You know, the temptations of their dark nature and where they come from. They get dark visions, they get some magic, they're lurkers, and they have resistance to necromancy. Turns out when you deal with negative energy, you resist necromancy. Uh, it just so happens that way. Hey, Dragonkin! Yes, Dragonkin. Um...
So, just as an important noting thing for organized play, because it's a thing, uh, I want to mention this. They have a partnered bond ability, and so you can partner with another character in your group, and it might be something you do. Uh, a Dragon Kid Adventure might choose not to form partner bond, but they must choose to form one later in their adventuring, or they may choose one to form one later in their adventuring hero. Once the partner is selected, it may not be replaced unless their partner is slain. We'll talk about partners. So they're native to the Sixth Planet in the Pack Worlds. Um, Trilus. Uh, a world of grueling season and dangerous environments. Most live bonded to non-Dragonkin partners using a traditional ritual that creates a nigh-unbreakable personal ties that last a lifetime. Uh, it's kind of a retrocyclical retro telepathy, contemplative movements, and other tactical advantages. They have an ability to fly and breathe a cone of energy. Uh, they're quite intimidating. They're fierce, and loyal, empathic, and adrapative. And like their true dragon cousins, they have strength and intelligence uh, to face nearly any task and have wide variety of, of occupations in the packed worlds. They get bonuses to strength and penalty dexterity. They have a breath weapon, draconic immunities, draconic vision, flight, and of course, the partner bond. Um, which uh, they communicate with each other telepathically with a range of 100 feet. If you're on 30 feet, uh, they both roll initiative checks separately and take the higher of the results. These are some of the things you get from it. So they're smaller than true dragons. Uh, they to still tower over most humanoids uh, because they are large sized, may I note. Standing on two legs with a height ranging from 8 to 20 feet. Uh, some tinker with their own genetics to achieve a compact size, while other, part, uh, other take pride in their formal statures. Terrestrial dragon can tend to be larger and have wings, while spacefaring dragonkins often prefer their modify their bodies to be smaller, leaner, and sometimes wingless. Uh, they have four muscular limbs. They are bipedal with strong tails providing stabilization. They can learn to maintain posture if they lose or have underdeveloped tails, and some choose to have prosthetics uh, or wheelchairs to aid mobilities and embrace quadrupedal mobility with or without assistance of such devices. So there's a lot of ways that they move around. Uh, paint their claws and horns, various colors and patterns is very stylish. Holographic uh, polish is commonly used, too. Um, the hues of their skills occur naturally in the spectrum of colors. Scale color has nothing to do with their alignment or ancestry, though some unusual color tends to uh, appear in certain families with any, without any known explanation. Uh, most are monochromatic, Though it is uncommon for scales to display two or three tones, uh, or often gradients or speckled patterns. Uh, they, they span the spectrum of genders, uh, as best identified by asking them. They don't have sexual morphism, and uh, their personal gender identity is often impacts their physical presentation. Uh, they embrace magic and science to modify their bodies to suit their physical preference. Uh, Traxius is their homeworld, of course, and, um, you know, it's a planet that, uh, you can look into yourself. I don't want to get in too much into it. But there are dragons there. Anyway. Um, basically, it's thought that, you know, dragonkin are descended from dragons and stuff like that. Uh, the dra original dragonkins were sometimes a product of uh, love for individual humans and their communities between giant and dragons. Some were brought as evil dragons short-term plans. But as dragons ran, reproduced with one another and other humanoids, they became the species that was separately disconnected from them. Basically, dragonkin are a fancy way of saying a lot of half-dragons kept getting in together with each other and then they came a, became their own species. Um, so, yes. That's a fancy way of saying perhaps that's where they came from. So, again, a lot of their society is around this partner bond uh, that they mainly form with humanoids. Com uh, commonly, the Viforians, a humanoid from their planet. Um, architecture, infrastructure, media reflects the importance of the bond. The majority of dragon can bond with a partner in their lifetime. Uh, not all do, though. It's a conscious choice between both parties to form bond, is, uh, and it feels to be kind of necessary. Uh... Those who decide to remain bondless face scrutiny of the community, but, you know, dragonkin are supportive of their choice, honestly. Um, bondless, bondless dragon can live integrated in their society. Um, 
And so Bondless Dragonkin will still find mates and create families uh, and work in vocational fields just with so much success. Um, they still perform communal homes, roommates, something like that. You know, it's the thing is, solitude isn't really a thing that dragon can like. They like being in a kind of communal kind of things. So that's why the, even if they don't partner bond, they still like being with others. Um, unbonded dragon can will enlist in Skyfire Legion. It's a chance to find bonds, train and mix recruits with various other, you know, with the other humanoids that are there. Um, and bonds are unique to individuals and are kind of personal. Um, most bonds aren't romantic. Um, it is kind of equivalent to marriage in many cultures. It has legal rights, responsibilities, and mutual living situations. Uh, some are in adolescent f uh, f uh, friendships, formalizing the bond to reach community. Uh, there are arranged bonds uh, to in certain communities. Um, so there's a lot about their society that's based upon the bonds and you can look into it more I, I think that's a kind of basic there and they do detail the bonding ritual so you can look into that too um, the Interspeller Species book is the main one that I would recommend checking out for looking into Dragonkin more uh, and a lot of the alien archives will have some of this information that they kind of dive into them but uh, Interspeller Species that's the one that dive deeper into Dragonkin let's move on though as I said I don't want to go on forever today we might uh, see how far we get here and let's talk about the Dromeda. They're bipedal mammalian species from near space, uh, from a planet, uh, Droma... Dromaritia. They're about five feet tall and about 200 pounds. Uh, they have ungulate-like legs, long hooved toes. They have shorter forelimbs that, uh, with strong dew claws and fingers that allow manipulations of tools. Long necks with drooped heads, atop which stubby eye stalks allow their eyes to move independently. Uh, giving them a wide field of visions. They have soft, fine fur that can be various shades of red and brown. Most of their history was the most populous and preferred prey item uh, for their home's various large carnivores. Yes. Their pre sapient ancestors formed tightly knit herds to keep safe. Uh, skittish creatures that reacted to danger first by emitting a deep moan that would alert the herd and bolt to the safety uh, in, in huge stampedes. They learned tunes, communicated in spoken languages, and developed more advanced technologies. They kind of retrained their behaviors, which continued to serve them well uh, in the galactic communities. Look, they aren't amphibians, though. They're camel people. That's different. They do look similar. But rather than being weird like frog people, they're weird camel people. Um, um, since they're sapient, they're not considered food to most sapient species, but there are a few evil species that do say they have a unique and savory flavor and think of them as very delicious. So if you're an evil species out there, they're delicious. <laughs> but yes, most sapients would be like, yeah, we're not going to eat another race. You know, oh, that's kind of weird. Um, they have large family units. They rarely do things individually. Uh, they're herbivores. Uh, they prefer large open spaces uh, for entire groups with good visibility, especially when eating. Um, half the group eats while the other caps keep watch. Uh, with the group switching roles and everybody goes to graze. So they are evolved from a grazing species. Their homes are very large, single-story buildings, plenty of exits so they can accommodate the entire herd. Uh, floors often grow grasses that they can feed on, so they can spend their time grouped together, uh, grazing safely from their homes. Um, herds can be large enough to staff entire cor cor uh, corporations, uh, while employees live and work together in large compounds with open floor plans. Such enterprises can be found in a staggering array of industries, providing products and services from a range of plant-based meat substitutes uh, to social media consultancy. Um, so, in their youth, they train in skills that they can provide services to the herds as adults. Members of their society find great importance and responsibility. Uh, the more the herd can provide for itself, the less it needs to depend on potentially dangerous outsiders. So, there's a kind of like, you're in your herd yourself. There are some curiosities of the outside world. They travel short distances from the herd in small groups called huddles. Um, when they're concerned with stuff that they find dangerous, 
uh, they head to the safety of the herd and warn others what they encountered. There are small groups that live predominantly in densely populated cosmopolitan urban areas uh, continue this trend. Uh, frequently li re rely on delivery services, ensuring no one needs to leave the herd to obtain supplies. So basically, like, you have the corporations who make things, but it's a single herd which makes the stuff and then provides it to other herds. Um, they don't consider leadership of a herd to be an honor or something to aspire to. Um, it's a virtue of their position, basically. They elect their leaders democratically for limited terms because um, the average one has no interest in taking the leadership role. Basically, the herd nominates candidates for office, uh, whether the individual wants to run or not. Um, rather than focus on their own achievements, many highlight the accomplishments that their opponent uh, uh, in, of their opponents in hopes of losing the election to someone else. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that, too. It's like, ah, oh, crap, I've been nominated. Look at how well my opponent has been doing. You should vote for them. Uh-huh. Crime within their society is rare, and the punishment is exile, which is kind of akin to death of their distant ancestors. In truth, modern ones feel much more the same way about this punishment, as much, uh, most uh, dread the subject of being uh, without the herd, when they find themselves alone, whether through exile or survivor attacked, um, or left behind because of sickness or injury, they look for surrogate herds to join. Uh, trust is difficult to earn, because um, everything could be potential danger, and they are kind of skittish, but they are loyal and comp constant companions when friendship is gained. Um, so, individual draw, uh, dramads form strong bonds with measures of other species, especially those of similar generalized fear and dangers like the slug-like Osharas from Alien Archive 2. They're from Alien Archive 3. Uh, adventurers and mercenaries are extremely rare um, as they choose path needed to overcome their power of instincts to flee within danger. Um, but when they're able to, they make excellent lookouts, first responders, or even bodyguards with their powerful legs running fast in the heat of battle. Um, so yeah. The opponents of Dex Wisdom penalty to Charisma. They alert the herd, bolt uh, their senses, uh, low light vision, dark vision, savory apparently is an actual thing, um, because apparently if something bites them, it wants to eat them. And they're swift, they have 40 foot land speed. So they're a very interesting species to talk about. I think I honestly might end with D. We didn't get very far today, but I'm feeling a little, uh, we're, we're, we're going through it and it's, uh, you know. Here's one that's probably going to be edited heavily because, honestly, there have been changes that have been going on. The Drow. Now, granted, like, Drow are being relooked at in Pathfinder First Edition. I'm curious as how they're going to be affected in Starfinder, especially, you know, uh, you know, maybe being of delicious, delicious drugs for other creatures. You're like, ooh, I could eat that. So. Let's talk about the Starfinder version of it, because we might have something akin to this in the Starfinder, but it might be called something else, too. Because, again, the walk away for going with it. So this is to asterisk. We're probably going to have big changes on this one in the future. What that is, we don't have it yet. But purple skin, white hair, uh, physically beautiful but merciless. The uh, common drow form a majority of civilian military forces and are governed more by powerful drow nobles. Uh, they are a matriarchal culture. Uh, common male doesn't have a lot of things. So very much so like the old, uh, you know, versus ruthless, ambushes, uh, you know, going after them. That kind of thing. Uh, their economy is around retrieving, reverse engineering, selling weaponry from planet-sized ships to claim their own. Uh, they've a, basically a... They're, they're known for having cutting-edge weaponry, finest armaments, stuff like that. Um, Spolgerize specialize in ranged weapons, teamwork tactics to undermine their phones of defenses. Snipers are important that, you know. Um, yeah. Uh, they have magical powers. Some are nobles that are born with more magical powers. Uh, like the uh, gifted progeny and talent. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. There's a lot to these that are kind of to be asterisked to be talked about. 
we're kind of gonna leave the basics for now and you know stuff with the pack worlds and stuff like that and the kind of connections with that and uh, what it means and stuff will be probably addressed in the future I don't know when Dex charisma bonuses con penalty they got the drow immunities drow magic light senses light blindness and some basic final statistics so that's the one that we'll 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 figure out more in the future how many more would be this for uh oh. There'd be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, six, six E's. Um, honestly, I think, as I was saying, I'm feeling a little um, overheated, honestly. So I think I'm going to end it here before I go too long, um, as a long video here. I'll have to save this for another day. As much as I wanted to get to E, F, and G... Maybe I'll cut these a little shorter. You know, I'll 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 kind of look into how long these are going to be, and then we'll uh, discuss them. But I had a bunch more that I had prepared, uh, honestly, and uh, just I don't physically want to overdo myself while making these videos for you people out there and talking about these things, because you don't want me falling over dead. But so. These are just some more of the species you can talk about in this, uh, you know, and some species you can play. Uh, and honestly, there is a large variety. As you can see, we just hit upon a few of the interesting things he, he, at here. And there is a huge list. I'll have to do more of these, where, you know, where I'm going to dive in and talk about them and go through Starfinder. And I'll try to... Maybe do these on, like, Tuesdays and stuff. Yeah, I gotta take care of myself, honestly. Uh, I'm feeling a little overheated, you know, and I don't want to push it too far. So, um, I do enjoy Starfinder in this way because it does introduce us to so many unique and interesting things. I mean, we had the uh, Moth People where, you know, you can have two different ones. You have a, you know, hive mind of, 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 of basically barnacles. Or you have, like, you know plant-like creatures that look like cephalopods. These are all interesting. The camel people, um, you know, are uh, dromadian. Um, a lot of these, the the uh, decimar, the, the moths, you know, the, the they're all very interesting, you know, very unique, and honestly add a lot of variety for the type of character you can come from. Where, you know, it's the idea, I think, with a space travel game where certainly you can accept where the society you come from a lot more, or you could reject it and find more interesting ways to play in it a lot of times. And I think that's something that hits home a lot harder here than it does in a lot of other places. While, you know, it's sort of like in a Pathfinder world, you're still going to be matching a lot with the society that you're in. This, there's a lot more of that possibility and interest in rejection that can still make sense and be very interesting to play and have. So I think it's 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 a good variety that adds a lot more here, I think, in a lot more of an interesting way. So we'll do more species in the future. Uh, I hope you enjoyed learning about these here. Uh, certainly, there are plenty more to go into, and it's just a matter of, you know, we'll go through them, we'll talk about them, I'll introduce them, and I hope you enjoy learning about a lot of them in the future you know i'm gonna get going i hope everybody has a wonderful rest of your day and until that next time uh okay remember chat me live on twitch.tv uh forward slash the Dracovan empire every tuesday thursdays saturdays for this i do other things uh some variety of gaming uh live shows like buccaneers shackled sea on wednesday nights discussing tabletop on saturday evening it's, it's great to have people live and chat and hang out with me and worm even if you're just lurking if you are watching this on you know give a follow there if you're watching if you're watching this on youtube hey leave a like leave a subscription leave a comment uh have you played any of these in starfinder i'm honestly interested you know well have you have you not that's that's a question i have so you know that's a good answer to have um yeah um all that kind of stuff. And there's other ways to support, you know, great ways to do that are there. Uh, Discord and Twitter for, or Discord and the website formerly known as Twitter for my schedules, brain farts and all that kind of stuff. And I think I've given enough shout outs for all the information I have to lay on the line there and say, thank you once again, all. I will see you all next time for more Starfinder. 
farewell.